Money. It's a crime. This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. Chapter 9, Chapter nine. of The Great Hunt. Leave takings. And this symbol is the opposite of the last one, the Flame of Tarvalon. I just noticed that. Me too. They uh, go together to make the symbol of the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai, which, of course, we see the seal here at the end of this chapter. Yeah. Vale Doman? 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 I say Doman. I say Doman. It's a little Jamaican. <laughs> I say Doman, you say Doman. Potato, potato. <laughs> tomato, tomato. Chapter 9, Leave Takings. <laughs> 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 The outer courtyard was an ordered turmoil. Were you going to say something? <laughs> you say Matt, I say Matt. <laughs> I've got nothing on that one. <laughs> the outer courtyard was an ordered turmoil when Rand reached it with his saddlebags and the bundle containing the harp and flute. The sun climbed toward midday. Men hurried around the horses, tugging at saddle girths and pack harnesses, voices raised. Others darted with last minute additions to the pack saddles or water for men working, or dashed off to fetch something just remembered. But everyone seemed to know exactly what they were doing and where they were going. The guard walks and archers' balconies were crowded again, and excitement crackled in the morning air. Hooves clattered on the paving stones. One of the pack horses began kicking, and stablemen ran to calm it. The smell of horses hung thick. Rand's cloak tried to flap in the breeze that rippled the swooping hawk banners on the towers, but his bow... Slung across his back, held it down. Long, long paragraph there. Yeah, it was. But, you know, I usually just stick with it. Sure. Read the first one. Notice he's still carrying around Tom's flute and harp. Yeah. How long does that go on for before he he gives him back, right? Yeah. I think he runs into him in Kyrian and gives them back then. Is that right? Snakes and foxes agrees with me. Great aim, by the way. Rand is leaving, and he mentions seeing a bunch of characters that are playing an important role later that are all leaving with him now. Ingtar, Reagan, Masima, Uno. The only thing I wanted to mention is that Mandarb is there, but Land's not. So Land's still off doing his task, whatever, task. whatever task he's supposed to be doing. So I think we had this question in the last chapter is, what's Land doing? And I haven't had any grand insight between then and now. Yeah, Moraine sent him to do something and we don't know what. Right. But he shows up in a second here. Other than confront Nynaeve, which may have been the task. Yeah, well. Because that's the only thing we see him doing between then and now. Rand runs into Loyal and apologizes but Rand says, this time there's no telling how long it will be or well, where we will end up. There was no telling when I first met you either. Besides, this is loyal, what held then holds now. I can't let the cha- chance pass to see history actually weave itself around it to Varen and to help find the horn. Matt and Perrin show up and Rand tries to apologize and they sort of ignore him. I like this description of Ingtar. He's got that crescent moon on his helmet with the yeah. two points pointing up. Mm-hmm. Which basically is just looks like horns. <laughs> I think that's a little subtle. I'm pu- oh, I'm putting my fingers on my head, so it looks like horns. Um, I think that's a little subtle. Like he's the bad guy. He's got devil horns. Yeah, maybe a bit. Doesn't does Lan have a similar helmet? He does. He's got definitely got a crest on it with two things coming up. With the moon. Yeah. I also noticed here Lan is in when Lan suddenly shows up. That's the next thing I have. Oh, I mean, other than uh, Matt and Perrin making fun of his coat. Yeah, I just have um, Rand apologizes and says, I said things I shouldn't to Loyal. Loyal grinned. I say things I should not all the time. The elders always said I spoke an hour before I thought. Their sense <laughs> of time is way off. Suddenly, Lan was at Rand's stirrup in his gray-green scaled armor that would make him all but disappear in forest or darkness. I need to talk to you, sheep herder. He looked at Loyal. Alone, if you please, builder. Lael nodded and moved his big horse away. Um, And we get a little speech here. If I skip the preamble, I'll just read this. Yeah. Well, it's it's sort of a funny 
the whole situation with Land is running up and being like, come here, I need to talk to you. It's a bizarre thing to say. Here's what sheathing the sword is. Because then he immediately leaves after. And then runs away. It's a very much, it's like a Chekhov's gun. It's this thing that like, they show you early in the book that you know has to be used before the book's over. Yeah. Like it's this like, really hey, one final, final trick in your face. One final trick. This thing you will absolutely definitely have to use at some point in this book. Yeah. Like is this By the way, when gun. you're losing the sword fight with Ishmael, here's right. this thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> here's how you can turn your lose, losing into a victory. Like it's, it's really in your face right there. Um, and it's really just an odd scene from Lan. And I'm yeah. not sure why he a- is acting this way. Listen, sheep herder, the warder growled. There will come a time when he must achieve a goal at all costs. It may come in attack or in defense. And the only way will be to allow the sword to be sheathed in your own body. That's crazy, Rand said. The warder cut him off. You will know when it comes, sheep herder, when the price is worth the gain and there is no other choice left to you. That is called sheathing the sword. Remember it. The Amerlin appeared striding through the crowded courtyard with Leanne. And we see a short conversation between them. Yeah, Algamar wants her to stay. She's like, I wasn't gonna I wasn't planning on staying. I'll see you later. He's he wants to like throw a big feast, and she's like, Nope, I've gotta get back. Yeah. Now and I wondered matters urgently require my presence in the White Tower. I should be there now. Politics. Do you have any ideas? Is do you think it's just politics? Yeah. Yeah. Because they speculate about something going on on Almuth Plain, but I don't think that's why she wants to get back. We might have skipped over this part. I'm not sure. But we see, like, in the midst of everything, a warder jumps on a horse's back and goes galloping off. I miss that. Sprinting. Oh, no, we didn't skip that part. When Rand looked down, the warder was gone. He's thinking of talking about Lan and nowhere to be seen. Loyal brought his horse back to Rand's side. That is a hard man to catch and hold, isn't he, Rand? He's not here, then he's here, then he's gone, and you don't see him coming or going. The wa- the warder the Emerlin had been speaking to, and I didn't read this part, but the warder the Emerlin had, was speaking to suddenly sprang into his saddle. He was at a dead gallop before he reached the wide standing gates. She stood watching him go, and her stance seemed to urge him to go faster. Where is he headed in such a hurry? Rand wondered aloud. I heard, Loyal said, that she was sending someone out today, all the way to Aradoman. There is word of some sort of trouble on Almuth Plain, and the Amelin seat wants to know exactly what. Uh, so the only thing, maybe the Sean Chan have shown up and they're capturing Aes Sedai. Yeah. And so she's investigating missing Aes Sedai. And there's, they've heard whispers that things are happening, but nobody's exactly sure what. Yeah. Yet. And this is on the other side of the continent. Right. But the Amelin <laughs> is sending someone. A warder off Probably back to Tarvalin with a message. Yeah, which I sort of imagine as sort of a Pony Express to gallop across the continent. Probably. Or just one guy going as fast as he can. But it would make more sense to have some sort of, I mean, maybe just buying new horses as he goes. Yeah. But it's sort of hard, you know, this news appears to have come with them. So it's, I don't, it doesn't really seem to make sense that it would be urgent for them to suddenly, <laughs> uh, to suddenly go back. So I, I just wonder if there's another purpose, you know, it's, it seems like the trouble in Faldar or the trouble on the plane isn't necessarily the reason she'd send someone running off. I just, I, I speculate if there's another reason. Hmm politics or i I like the the politics oh yeah i assume that's why she's headed back i guess what i was thinking before is that partially that but also the fragile political situation in the tower yeah yeah there's a little bit here from loyal and he's sort of lamenting that the ogier have withdrawn into their steading yeah and I think that's important for his personality. I mean, I think it's a big part of his um, motivation is that he wants not just himself to be out of the steading, but he wants all of Ogier to come out. All his, he thinks that the world outside the steading is wonderful, and he sort of seems to have a lot of regret that they've regressed in, into the steading. And that comes through in his final speech to the stump that, gets the ogier out and supporting rand yeah anyway just one of the corner i just noticed like, like that's a sort of a cornerstone of his personality is the 
the no, idea that one Ogier that isn't following the Ogier suit. Exactly. It's it's why he's out here and none of the other ones are. Yeah. The Arlen seat says glory to the builders, loyal Kirison. And I wanted to look that up because I, I thought I was like, is that his last name? What's going on there? Oh no, I think it, it's a word. It's a means just builder in the old tongue. Gotcha. So she says glory to the builders, loyal builder. Agelmar's eyes widen when the boys don't bow. Why don't the boys bow with the rest of them? They don't really know better. I Do uh, you think it's just like ignorance? Yeah. Well, they have a poor understanding of that kind of formality. You don't bow to anyone in the two rivers. Right. And not, I'm just, I don't just mean figuratively. I mean, literally, they have no concept of, of royalty or, you know, that's why that sort of hierarchy. They don't have that. That's why Rand had to imitate Gawain. Yeah, he had no idea what he was doing. It's something that they literally have only heard of in stories. Uh, this is the true hunt for the horn. You ride to find the horn of Valir, she said. This is Suwan speaking. And the hope of the world rise with you. The horn cannot be left in the wrong hands, especially in Dark Friend's hands. Those who come to answer its call will come whoever blows it. And they are bound to the horn, not to the light. Which is wrong. We were talking about this earlier. Yeah, that's definitely a bit of misinformation there. Because we know when, let's say at the end of this book, when Ardor Hawkwing shows up, he says the horn has been blown. And then he sort of basically lists a few conditions which have to be true in order for him to fight. And that those include that Rand has to be on the battlefield and they have to fight beneath the sign of the Aes Sedai, the banner of the dragon. Hmm. And so without the banner, that's why the banner ends up saving his life is because without the banner, the heroes of the horn would not have been able to fight for Rand. Yeah. You know, I never put much thought into that, but it, the horn does come with the banner. Absolutely. And when Matt blows it, he is bound to it until he dies. From, yeah. And then he's brought back due to bale fire. He dies, but he never dies. <laughs> yeah. I think he, you know, I, I actually do think he was dead for a little while. Yeah. And that's why it was severed. And he didn't die from the um, hanging. His heart stopped for a little while, but he never died from that. Um, but the, when he was the, when he was brought back from the dark hound death by Balefire, mm-hmm. or uh, was it no? It was, it was lightning. Lightning killed him. When the wall falls on him? No, Wait, no, 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 no. So there's one time where he gets slobbered on by dark hounds and ran Balefire's the dark hounds, and yeah. then he ends up just getting like a drop on him, and that saves his life. But he never died that time. Mm-hmm. And then there's another time where he gets lightninged by, I believe it's Ravine. Oh, I thought the... And yeah. then when Ran Bale fires Ravine... Is he lightninged personally? I just remember the wall falling on him, and then you don't know if he's dead or not. Oh, right? no, that's Until just an Ebu Dar. That's not the wall. Oh, why am I... I'm bl- okay, I'm blending those together. Yeah. So he actually, a lot of them... A- Avienda dies, a bunch of them die in that battle. Like, there's a whole... Uh, uh, Osmodian dies in that battle. Like a whole bunch of them are killed by that lightning. There's a whole scene. Like yeah. in a, in a lot of ways, Matt dying and living again. He's not the only one. There's a bunch of them that die and live again in that scene. I'm gonna cut into this scene. There's a lot here. The Amerlin went on, but Rand was no longer listening. The Watcher was back. The hair stirred on the back of his neck. He peered up at the packed archers' balconies overlooking the courtyard. At the rows of people jammed along the guard walks atop the walls, somewhere among them was the set of eyes that had followed him unseen. The ga- gaze clung to him like dirty oil. It can't be a fade, not here. Then who? Or what? He twisted in his saddle, pulling red around, searching. The bay began to dance again. So, the Watcher was back. Yeah. I w- didn't see any reference to the Watcher in this chapter. And the Watcher he's talking about, I assume, and we talked about this a little before we started recording, but I think the Watcher is Lanfear. Yeah, we've we've talked about this in a a few previous chapters, I think. Right. A few previous episodes. Somebody's been following him around. There's often a chill associated with it. Yeah. And so I think that Watcher... The chill, 
Yeah. And the gays clung to him like dirty oil. Strange. Yeah. So that makes me think that... I, I, it's not a fade. Yeah, it's not a fade. But I'm wondering, is it the assassin? Probably a gray man this time. Gays like dirty oil is what made me think that it might be like a gray man or or some other creature of the dark. That's I couldn't remember any other reference to a gaze clinging like dirty oil. That seems to be more reminiscent of the taint. Right. But like we were we were saying before we started recording the um the hair stands on the back of his neck so it's a chill. I don't know that it necessarily has to do with channeling. The dirty oil gaze could be a gray man maybe, but gray men usually get right in there and just stab somebody. Right. They're usually just going for it. It's they don't spend a lot of time watching or shooting. Right. Oh, we do we do see Do we? Well, we see one gray man assassinated with a crossbow bolt. What? Mm, but I think that was actually Oh, was, was it Slayer? Shuriam covered it up. Well, someone we think is trying to kill Rand. Yes. The arrow's meant for Rand. And he got let in through the dog gate. And due to chant, pure, probably Tavarin chance luck, Rand turns at the last second and the arrow passes by him. Could it be a gray man? Dark friend. They never find, do they ever find him? I don't think so. The shooter? He gets away. Yeah. So Gray Man seems like a solid. What about during Ingtar's confession? Does he say, I think he says something about like. The assassin? Yeah. I never knew what he was going to do, Ingtar said softly, as if talking to himself. He had his sword out, testing the edge with his thumb. A pale little man you didn't seem to really even notice when you were looking at him. So it was a Gray Man. Gray Man. Take him inside Faldara, I was told, inside the fortress. I did not want to, but I had to do what you understand. I had to. I never knew what he intended until he shot that arrow. So, all right, let me get back to where we were. But yeah, so definitely a gray man shooting at him. Yeah, and it was definitely meant for Rand, not the Amerlin. Absolutely. Well... So Ingtar lets the gray man in. Yes, which means he probably killed the gate guards. Because that's what letting him in would... <laughs> you would have to. You would have to. Nobody else would be able to open it. Perhaps the two guards were the ones who... The two jailers were the ones who ended up killing them? Yeah, maybe. I like that better. Uh, otherwise, Hurin would know. Fane was let out by somebody. Because he, he said, oh, you're not who I expected. So you think the two jailers who were corrupted by Fane are the ones who killed the gu- gate guards? Because somebody slit their throats, the gate guards' throats. Yeah. And then there were the jailers who were beheaded. Okay. I'm try- I'm going to try to walk this through lo- logically. Yeah. If, um, if Ingtar let Pat and Fane out. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Who killed the guards? I think it's possible he let Pat and Fane out and then Fane killed the guards. Fane killed the guards. and Yeah, after Ingtar let him out. So Ingtar did not kill the guards. I think Fane would have done that. And then Ingtar lets the Gray Man and Trollocs in. The Gray Man hides. The Trollocs... Do you think Fane may have killed the gu- the gate guards on his way out with... Ingtar? Well, the the Trollocs ripped apart the guards' bodies. Or the, I'm sorry, the jailers' bodies. Oh, that's, okay. That's who killed the jailers. So they had to be in there. So he must have let, he must have let the Trollocs in first before he let Fane out. Unless we have two actors happening here. Unless Leandrin was the one who let him out. But we've got quotes from Robert Jordan saying Ingtar was the one who let him out. So this is the thing. I've got I've got this quote from Robert Jordan saying that Ingtar let Fane out of jail. And we know from Ingtar himself at the end of the book that he did the gate thing. 
he opened the gate for the Trollocs. Yeah. But Well, hold on. He no, didn't. he didn't. He opened the gate for a single gray man. He didn't let any Trollocs in. How did the Trollocs get in? Here's something. Yeah. If you slit the th- someone's throat with the power, does that leave a scent on you for a sniffer to sniff? I think you're doing violence. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to find some way around someone let the Trollocs in. I don't think it was Ingtar. Otherwise, because you would have had to slit the guards' throats before opening the door. Or, or Ingtar opens the door, Trollocs come in, slit the guards' throats. I mean, would the guards stop Ingtar if he just wanted to open it for whatever reason? Probably not, but I don't think he let any Trollocs in. He only let the gray man in. Yeah. According to his quote. Hmm. He doesn't say anything about Trollocs. No, he doesn't. He only says he was guilty because he let the, the assassin in. Could have been Leandrin. I mean, Leandrin doesn't ever come near her in. So no one would know if it was her. There's just there's too many dark characters, and yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm struggling because it doesn't seem like Inktar could have done everything, and there's just too many other characters. There's the Gray Man, there's Leandrin, there's the Trollocs, there's the corrupted jailers. There's just too many suspects in these murders <laughs> to narrow it down. Yeah. Oh, and and Lanfear's wandering around while we're at it. Right. She could have just slit their throats for the fun of it. Yeah. We see her use the power to cut a guy's throat when she's summoned to uh fight the when during the cleansing. Hmm. And you know, the watcher even in this scene with the arrow could be could be Lanfear watching Rand. No, no. But then the greasy work. eyes doesn't don't seem to fit. No. You know, we've got this sort of uh <laughs> And and Lanfear doesn't want Rand dead. No. Ish does. Yes. I, I think the whole the Grey Man assassination is hundred percent Ishmael. Which is all yeah, this is all coming from the Dark Friend Social, which was directed by Bael Zaman. Yeah. But there's multiple parties at work here. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know how the Trollocs got in. Yeah, you know, I think there's too many actors. I think Ishmael's responsible for the Gray Man and the Trollocs, likely. Agreed. Lanfear is there, but she's she's. We know her game is to manipulate Rand, right? Not to kill him or even attack him. She's her game for now. For like the next couple of books, is to just mess with his head and you know do all sorts of try to get him to fall in love with her. We can own the world together. That whole bit. She wants her Lewis Theron back. Yeah. Get the Choden call. Defeat the Dark One. Rule yeah. the world. Three easy steps to world domination. <laughs> <laughs> Profit. I'm going to keep reading. Yeah. I'm just uh, – sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm getting – I'm like playing three-dimensional chess in my head. Yeah. And I'm trying to like put all the pieces together and, and nothing – Nothing stands out as a solution that's any better than any other solution that I can come up with. I like what Enigma is saying. Um, that's why it is always hard to catch the Black Aja and Dark Friends. They're everywhere. If you see one, you miss three. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you have Fane, who's kind of working at cross purposes, even though he's being rescued by the dark side. Yeah. He's also got his own agenda. Mm-hmm. And... Ends up taking the horn somewhere else entirely. Well. Okay. Well, enough of spinning our <laughs> wheels on that. Ran twisted in his saddle, pulling but, red I around, mean, searching. Well, I guess I just want to say one last thing. Um, obviously, the the whole point of sending the Trollocs in and freeing Fane was to get the horn. Yeah. Right? And maybe, Yes. So you've got the assassin whose purpose is to kill Rand, but then the whole Trollocs and rescuing Fane. To kill Rand later. He's left yeah. behind on purpose. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I'm i glad that we have uh, help on this. <laughs> this is really where we need it. 
Hopefully editing will pull that together into something that's comprehensive. <laughs> he twisted in his saddle, pulling Red around, searching. The bay began to dance again. Suddenly, something flashed across in front of Rand's face. A man passing behind the Amerlin cried out and fell, a black fletched arrow jutting from his side. The Amerlin stood calmly, looking at a rent in her sleeve. Blood slowly stained the gray silk. A woman screamed, and abruptly, the courtyard rang with cries and shouts. The people on the walls milled furiously, and every man in the courtyard had his sword out. Even Rand, he was surprised to realize. Agilmar shook his blade at the sky. Find him, he roared. Bring him to me. His face was went from red to white when he saw the blood on the Amarillan's sleeve. Begs for forgiveness. Nonsense, Agilmar, the Amarillan said. Leanne, stop fussing over me and see to that man. I've cut myself worse than this more than once cleaning fish. And later she says, a poor shot for a white clock bowman, or even a dark friend. Her eyes flickered up to touch Rand's. If it was at me, he aimed. A poor shot for a what? A white clock, but bo- white cloak bowman. What did I say? <laughs> a white clock. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. A poor shot for a white cloak bowman, or even a dark friend. Her eyes flickered up to touch Rand's. If it was at me that he aimed. <laughs> it wasn't aimed at her, and she knows it. So that's just sort of all the fallout from that assassination attempt. <laughs> Whenever I think of Suan talking about gutting fish, I always think of that Simpsons episode where they like get trapped in a Japanese fish processing factory. <laughs> and uh, there's a big thing on the wall that's like, knife goes in, guts come out, that's out. <laughs> like, and it's just like this little thing that they're singing all day while they're gutting fish. Just classic Simpsons. And I think of that every time <laughs> Suan talks about gutting fish. Mr. Sparklow. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen that episode. Uh-huh. Mr. Sparkle, I think. Oh, yeah. Video on the Discord? Or just the, the picture? Yeah, that's it. That's totally <laughs> it. <laughs> so, Armalyn basically says, don't let this slow you down. You are on the true great hunt for the horn and sends them off. Yeah, back to the chapter. (laughs) Turning away from the Simpsons. (laughs) The Amerlin turned back to Ingtar, and the men gathered behind him. She did not look at Rand again. He was surprised to see her smile suddenly. I wager Ilian does not give its great hunt for the horn so rousing a send-off, she said, but yours is the true great hunt. You are few, so you may travel quickly— Yet enough to do what you must. I charge you, Lord Ingtar of House Shinoa. I charge all of you. Find the Horn of Valir, and let nothing bar your way. Ingtar whipped his sword f- from his back and kissed the blade. By my life and soul, by my house and honor, I swear it, mother. Then ride. Ingtar swung his horse toward the gate. The only little bit I wanted to talk about... Oh, wait, no, never mind. So she just basically says, don't, l- don't let this stop you. Ride. And he goes. So Rand ends up riding with Inktar. And we sort of get this little bit of news that Changu and Nido. I was saying Nidao in my head, Nidao? but I have no idea. Uh, I'm not sure. Changu and Nidao are gone, Inktar said abruptly. And so this is where he seems pretty upset about that. I wonder, you know, because he didn't know they were dark friends, I bet. Or didn't know they were corrupted by Fane. Or, right. And we don't... It could have been either of those things. My my little theory is here that Ingtar is thinking, like, holy shit, this is real. The end is happening. The, horn, the dark has the horn. And he's kind of maybe second-guessing everything already. Second-guessing becoming a dark friend. I mean, we know he feels some guilt about opening that dog gate. Um, but I still think he's fully in, you know, his motivations are fully that of a dark friend at this point. Yeah. I don't think he's gone down his sort of uh, redemption path yet. And so I think he's pissed because he didn't, you know, he thinks they were dark friends. Right. But he doesn't know they were corrupted by Fane. But 
I think he's upset that he didn't realize that beforehand. Right. I think he's surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we get an introduction to Huron, who's one of my favorite tertiary characters. Me too. He's uh, he's a good guy. He's like loyal in that he's just like he's he's loyal. <laughs> yeah. A man on horseback forced his way through the throng lining the street and joined in behind Ingtar. He was a townsman by his clothes, lean, with a lined face and graying hair cut long. A bundle and water bottles were lashed behind his saddle, and a short bladed sword and a notched sword breaker hung at his belt, along with a cudgel. Ingtar noticed Rand's gla- glances. This is Hurin, our sniffer. There is no need to let Aes Sedai know about him. Not that what he does is wrong, you understand. The king keeps a sniffer in Thalmoran. And there's another, in Angkor Dale. It's just that I said I seldom like what they do not understand, and with him being a man, it's nothing to do with the power, of course. You tell him, Hurin. Yes, Lord Ingtar, the man said. He bowed low to Rand from his saddle. Honor to serve, my lord. Call me Rand. Rand stuck out his hand, and after a moment Hurin grinned to lo- and took it. As you wish, my lord Rand. And this is another one of those talents, like being a wolf brother or seeing... To Viren, that seems to be non-power related talents. Yeah, which we definitely need to do a show about. Yeah, we're we're fixing to. But we see two interesting things here that I noticed. First of all, Hearn says that he knows of at least two other sniffers. Yeah, that definitely are alive and employed in Shinar alone. It um, makes sense. It would be valuable because Trollocs are much easier to pick out than sure. anyone else so it seems like a, a border it would be a valuable skill to have in the borderlands yeah and we hear her and describe his talent which um the most of the information we have about sniffers comes from this right here i'm a sniffer you see been one four years this sunday i never heard of such a thing before then but i hear there's a few others like me it started slow catching bad smells where nobody else smelled anything and it grew took a whole year before I realized what it was. I could smell violence, the killing and the hurting, smell where it happened, smell the trail of those who did it. Every trail's different, so there's no chance of mixing them up. Lord Ingtar heard of it and took me in his service to serve the king's justice. You can smell violence, Rand said. You mean you can really follow somebody who, say, killed another man by smell? And he says, I can smell a battlefield ten years old though the trails of men who were there are gone. Up near the Blight, the trails of the Trollocs almost never fade. Not much to a Trolloc, but killing and hurting. A fight in a tavern, though, with maybe a broken arm, that smell's gone in hours. So the way I sort of think of it in my head is that every time you do val- a little bit of violence, it's like taking a vial of perfume and breaking it wherever you are. And most of the smell is going to be in the location where you break that vial, but a good amount of it is going to cling to you, and you're going to smell like that for a long time. Yeah. And wherever you go, you're going to leave, like, a little bit of that smell behind. Like, the greater the violence, the bigger the vial. Exactly. So, like, Hearn says, like, beating someone up even pretty badly is only, like, a few drops. Exactly. In a few hours, it's kind of gone off you. But, you know... But a battlefield where many men died, he can smell years later. And since Trollocs are eating their victims that died in violence, they're just constantly, you know, dosing themselves in perfume. And yeah. So they just never fades. <clears throat> so and apparently he must have, he was investigated by a brown Ajaw yeah. sister. I was wondering if you had any idea who that could have been. I want to believe it's Varen, but there's no... But Varen's there, and I feel like he would have been like oh yeah that one over there but doesn't Varen leave with the party like Varen leaves with the Aes Sedai in a different direction true it could be any brown sister it, yeah that's and, and also this whole she kept muttering is it old come again or new I feel like that's a phrase we've heard before I want to that's kind of why I wanted to think it was Varen because it sounded like something our main one of our main cast might say maybe but you know I have nothing to back that up right I just imagined her face saying it when I read that line. But r- right after that, Rand could not help remembering Moraine. Old barriers weaken. There is something of dissolution and change about our time. Old things walk again, and new things are born. We may live to see the end of an age. And yeah, I don't know if it's something about the pattern 
is it maybe spitting out needed? Yeah, I, th- I think that the talents are arising again because of the need for them. Yeah. And I've always sort of had a little bit of headcanon that, you know, it's possible that people were born with some of these talents or the potential to have some of these talents, but they never really manifested because they weren't needed. You know? Right. You know, in the way that Perrin's talent as Wolf Brother sort of manifests when he encounters wolves, it's entirely possible to go through your entire life without running into a pack of wolves. Yeah. Um, and so maybe the talent would have never manifested. Or maybe you have a couple of weird experiences and you just kind of, you know. Right, whatever. Yeah. yeah. You, you you smell something awful, but it doesn't really occur to you that that's what violence smells like. If you're like Min and you see things that come true and you just never say anything about it. Yeah, because it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> How do you explain that to someone? If I started smelling violence, I'd probably be like, man, I need a vacation. <laughs> I'm working too hard. <laughs> Well, I like the idea uh, that Discord's coming up with that the talents are a counterbalance to the bubbles of evil. Hmm. That the pattern is sort of creating something positive that's helpful in order to counterbalance the, the evil and corruptive nature of the, the bubbles. Aradia said, are people destined to be good if they have a talent? And I said, well, Slayer isn't good. But Slayer's talent wasn't innate or part of the pattern, it was instilled upon him by emerging of souls That's by true. the Dark One. He's kind of directly tainted by the Dark One. Yeah. So there is that. He doesn't have any natural talent. It was entirely uh, artificially created at Shale Ghoul. And I mean, there's chosen dreamers, forsaken dreamers, but they're all true. channelers. It's a little bit different than uh, yeah. the non-power talents. Power-related talents, I feel like that's just like what part of the power you're good at. Mm. Um, yeah. that you have a talent in the power versus non-power related talents which seem to be emerging at the demand of the pattern and don't seem to be related to the power at all and yeah Slayer is the only example that I can come up with off the top of my head of someone who has a talent or two people technically that have a talent <laughs> that aren't good because you know we have Perrin, Elias Hurin, I'm sure we could think of more examples but Go through my talent list. That's a good theory. I'm having trouble... uh, Punching holes in it? Yeah. Yeah, me too. And that would explain why the frequency is going up as well. There's Um. tree singing, but they're all Ogier and possibly Rand. Doomseer. The only one of which we know is Min. Tavarin, which always seemed to be on the side of the light. Oh, yeah. Well, they're on the the side of the pattern. They don't even have a choice. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's always a counterbalance. You know, Tavirin are, are very definitely... Well, you know, I mean, Ardor Hawkwing, you can say he wasn't necessarily good, and he was Tavirin. Um, Yeah, gone through my... He list, was necessary. ...list of talents. The only other one I have is the voice, which is something we only hear a reference to in the pro- prologue of the Eye of the World, which may have, probably has to do with tree singing. Yeah, I would assume that that was just a... Uh, the talent for singing, for being a, a singer. Then the affinities and all the power-related talents. Yeah. There's only a few, a handful of non-power-related talents. Dreaming is one that I included because we see... We see a good amount of non... Wolf brothers can dream. Yeah. A bunch um, of the wise women can dream that can't channel. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. perfect. That's why actually a lot of them, I think... Two of the four that Egwene is apprenticed with are non-channeler dreamers. One thing here, uh, Huron says he can't tell a dark friend by smell. Yeah. Um, which I think is an important point. You know, they, he can only smell the violence that they do. Right. So they would have to actually do the violence. Which makes sense. Smell. He can't smell an allegiance. Yeah. Which is all being a dark friend really is. So people were wondering if intent has anything to do with the the vileness of the smell. That perhaps the you know if you killed someone for a noble reason, would the smell be any less than killing someone because it was fun? Hmm. I don't know that we ever find out. It's sort of an it you know is Huron's scent able to take intent into account? It's it's sort of a weird judicial question. Right, if you like trip and fall and accidentally knock someone over and they break their leg, like does that count? 
Is that violence? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, no, I, I'm maybe. shrugging. <laughs> yeah. So it's I, it, it's it seems like <laughs> it's a violent accident would play some part. Hmm. I would think, and nothing to back this up, but I would think an executioner. I'm responding to Aradia again. I would think that an executioner would have the smell. They've done. Yeah, they've certainly done violence. It seems like intent would play a part. Honestly, we got to pay attention to her and in the future. But yeah. I mean, I, you know, we we don't really use his sense of smell to, like, debate over the finer arts of courtroom no. manipulations. <laughs> really, he's just, he's like, oh, they smell bad, so they're over there. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't seem to be a really fine-tuned instrument. It just seems, you know, just like when someone farts in a room, like, you know there's someone who's stinky. <laughs> But you're not really sure who it is. You know, sense of smell is not the most precise tool. So I'm going to go with it's just it's just not precise enough to make these sorts of measurements. Right. Yeah, not that precise. But mm-hmm. he maybe couldn't tell what someone had done, but he would be able to tell the strength of the... And, you know, uh, yeah, act. and whatever. And Fane, Fane's done a lot of violence. No, but there may be something else going on with Vane, with his corrupted soul. It seems like there's something more going on with the... the, Because Vane smells especially bad. He says that over and over and over again. Yeah. He mentions mentions that here. It's that something even worse, Light Help Me. Because he can follow the Trollocs and the Halfmen, and he can identify those, but there's something else with them, and that's Vane. It's interesting he didn't get a smell at Vane when he was in the dungeons. I'll skip ahead a little here. He rode after Ingtar in the Grey Owl Banner, south. The wind was making up, and cold against his back. Despite the sun, he thought he heard laughter in it, faint and mocking. And again, I think that might be Lanfear. Yeah, I thought it was a little interesting that the next line is, even though we're skipping to, even though we're switching to Doman's perspective in Ilion, the waxing moon lit the humid, night-dark streets of Ilion which still rang with celebration left over from the daylight. So we go right from faint laughter to moon imagery. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a really land fear thing. Very land fear. So yeah, and then we get our, is this our final perspective switch of this chapter? Where we go to uh, our favorite pirate, Bale Doman. <laughs> he do be. He's a, he's a pirate, right? Let's, let's uh, call it like it is. Yeah, he's... A smuggler. (laughs) Every day was a carnival until the hunt departed, and every night. Doman spared little thought for fireworks, or for the hunt. He was on his way to meet men he thought might be trying to kill him. So this is the great festival that Tom wanted to go to. Uh, Remember when he was with Rand, and he was like trying to get them away from the the Aes Sedai, and he was like, we can go down, they're calling the hunt, we can win this great prize. Yeah, they would have been there. Totally. But Tom is not there, unfortunately. He crossed the Bridge of Flowers over one of the city's many canals into the perfumed quarter, the port district of Ilion. The canal smelled of too many chamber pots, with never a sign that there had been flowers near the bridge. The quarter smelled of hemp and pitch. Is that the only reference to hemp we hear in the pull book? I don't think so. I think there's a couple of references to hemp being used as a, a like hemp ropes and yeah, that sort of thing. I mean, it's a it's a great plant. Notice there's a lot of illuminators here as well. This is one of the two. Don't they have one chapter house in Tanchico and one here in Ilion? He pushed into an inn under a sign of a big white striped badger dancing on its hind legs with a man carrying a silver shovel. Easing the badger, it was called, though not even Nieta Sidoro, the innkeeper, knew what the name meant. There had always been an inn of that name in Ilion. We were talking about this earlier, and um, Moraine and Lan show up later. Nieta Sidoro is Blue Aja Eisenir's agent. Yeah, because she knows Moraine when they show up at the inn. And calls her by a code name. Totally. <laughs> and <laughs> easing the badger it sounds really <laughs> dirty. <laughs> the talk was soft, but Doman caught mentions of the hunt and of the false dragon the Merundians had taken and of the one the tyrants were chasing through Haddon Merck. There had seemed to be some question whether it would be preferable to see the false dragon die or the tyrants, because he's an alien. Yeah. Tyrants. 
I don't know why I said tyrants. Oh, uh, just some some follow up. The Shan Chan don't need fireworks in Tanchico because they have skylights. They just have their channelers do it. So yeah. they just disband the chapter house in Tanchico. They have better than fireworks. They have the one power for entertainment. And the other chapter house is actually in Kyrian, not here oh, okay. in Ilian. There is no chapter house in Ilian. They're just they have a bunch of illuminators for the festival. The festival. We see a brief description of Nieta Sidoro, who, like I said, shows up later a little bit. And then Captain Doman meets with these three sketchy dudes. Mm-hmm. Captain Doman, we have a personage who must be brought from Mayin to Ilian. Spray be a river craft, Doman cut him off. Her draft be shallow, and she has no keel for the deep water. It was not exactly true, but close enough for landsmen. Which, I mean, he's going to take it on the Yeah, he ocean. knows he can. Yeah, he can totally <laughs> do that. He's, you just, can, he's bullshitting him. You can coast to Mayin easily, easily enough. Surely, Captain, you would be willing to sail along the shoreline for a thousand gold marks. Despite himself, Doman goggled. And so we see basically here... These people kind of negotiate with him, with Captain Doman. These uh, mysterious people AKA offer dark him friends, yeah, or something. I well, oh, the whole point is they're trying to get him to get the seal, to get the seal. So I, I assume, you know, he's been chased all the way down the river by Trollocs and dark friends. You know, that's why he wasn't suspicious. That suspicious when Rand and Matt jumped on the boat. With Trollocs after them, you know, he's been chased this whole time by mm-hmm. people trying to get the seal. He doesn't even believe the Trollocs are after Rand and Matt. No, he doesn't. Oh, because they've been after him. And so all of these folks, you know, and this is not the first attempt by someone to try and get him. They're trying to push him in a way where they can confiscate his cargo. Yeah. Basically, they say for more money than you could make in years – deliver this letter to the port master of Mayin mm-hmm. and bring a person back to, with you and you'll make a ton of freaking money. Doman says, yeah, sure. <laughs> and takes the money leaves. It's a weird back and forth, but it turns out that, you know, he's said no to a couple of the groups. And every time he does that, they kill one of his crewmates. Right. So here he's like, uh, yeah, I'll do that. And we find that out in a second, but, he takes the money and leaves, says he'll do it. thought it was interesting that he notices that all the coins have the flame of Tarvalon on them, which would be dangerous to have in Alien, especially with white cloaks around. And so they're, they're for, trying to force him to move. Yeah. They don't want him to just sit on the money. These men had made sure he would not simply take the gold and stay in Alien. And then he runs into his, is it first mate? Nidia doesn't believe in snow or Trollocs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. But she just, she doesn't so believe warm. in Trollocs or snow. Yeah. <laughs> They're both equally improbable and both equally... I imagine Ilian's like Miami. Which is apparently getting like snow this week. <laughs> I hear the weather's crazy Well, that's crazy because the there. world's ending. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, we're destroying it. His first mate says another one of their crew members is dead and had been worked on for a time with a knife. They wanted him to give some information, although we don't know what. I mean, I think they were asking him where the seal is stored. Probably. They were trying to trying to figure out where it was on the ship. The maid also says, somebody tossed my room at the Silver Dolphin last night. Took some silver, so I'd think it was thieves, but they left that belt buckle of mine, the one set with garnets and moonstones, laying out in plain sight. What's going on, Captain? The men are afraid, and I'm a little nervous myself. Dumon reared to his feet. Rouse the crew, Yaren. Find them and tell them spray sails as soon as there's doobie men enough to aboard to handle her. Rouse them, Yaren, for I'll leave any man who no makes it, standing on the quay as he is. You gotta throw a little bit of a pirate accent and do it when you're reading <laughs> Vail I'm embarrassed to try. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's all the better radio. Come on, let's uh, let's hear it. <laughs> Demond gave Yaren a shove to start him running, then stalked off towards the docks. Even footpads who heard the clinking pouch he carried steered clear of him, for he walked now like a man going to do murder. I mean, they killed his crew member, even though he agreed to do what they asked. Like, he's pissed off. Yeah. They're trying to find the seal. Mm. But this is... 
Well, if Doman wasn't a pretty savvy guy, he'd probably have fallen for this. Yeah, although they're they're pretty transparent. I mean, it's three or four times now that they've been doing it. Yeah. They're not exactly hiding the tracks that well. It may not be the same people. You think it's just a bunch of... I th- Well, I think it's coordinated. Could be. But this last attempt looks like they were looking for information. The other two seemed more like this is what happens when you say no. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, I think I think maybe they were just they're getting a little desperate at this point and they're like trying to just steal it in any way, shape or form that they can. So Demano, of course, gets back to the ship and as the ship is leaving, he opens the letter, breaks or doesn't break the seal, but opens the letter. He like heats up a knife and m- melts the wax to get it off the paper. Yeah. And then so he can reseal it. And he finds that it says, bother reading the whole thing, but basically that the bearer of this letter is a dark friend wanted in Kyrian for murders and other foul crimes. And it appears to be signed by the king. Of Kyrian. Of Kyrian. Who uh, Tom ends up killing later. Yeah. This is the the king that ends up, you know, in the course of the game of houses, killing Dena? Dina? I think that's right. Yeah, killing Dina. And Tom takes his revenge and ends up killing the king. And I think that it's unlikely that this letter is actually from the king of Kyria. I think it's forged. Me too. I don't. I, as far as I can tell, he's not a dark friend. He's not really influenced by dark friends. And it would be kind of an odd thing for him to write. We never really see any motivation for him to have written this letter. Yeah, no. It just seems very well faked. Also in the letter, we see that Doman's possessions are to be given to the people that show up and the ship and what, whatever cargo or whatever can be kept by the people who detained him. And right. that's kind of the deal. And um, that gives Doman the clue that they're actually after his stuff. Yeah. That and the fact that they've been tossing the room and stealing stuff to cover up the fact that they're looking for something. He collected old things as much as he could living on shipboard. What he could not buy... Because it was too expensive or too large, he collected by seeing and remembering. All those remnants of times gone, those wonders scattered around the world that had first pulled him aboard a ship as a boy. And this is just a part of Doman's personality. He enjoys this stuff and Mm -hmm. collects. a collector of old things. Yeah. He's a smart guy. He likes history. He looks through his stuff. And we know he has a lot more than this, but. These are the things he picked up in Meridon when he was in the Borderlands. So he says... He picked up four items, um, and he sort of goes through them to try and decide which one they're after. A light stick, left from the Age of Legends, or so it was said. We don't know, but... I but, assume that that makes it. It's a stick that lights up when you hold it. That he, would be useful. And pretty sweet. He's had one before, so obviously they're not after that because it's not like a unique item. Yeah. I mean, rare, certainly, but... He, he describes it, but it's basically a glow stick that reacts to touch. Yeah. And when you break it, it burns. Yeah, when you break it, it explodes. <laughs> so don't break it. A small, aged, dark ivory carving of a man holding a sword. I think that's an angriol for men. I thought so, too. Um, it looks just like Rand's fat man, but it's lot. not It's yeah. not the same. I don't think. No, I don't think so, either. It looks a lot like Moraine's ivory figurine, too. The fellow who sold it claimed if you held it long enough, you started to feel warm. That's a man who can channel. <laughs> I didn't catch that, but that's great. I I thought it was just like a pitch that he heard from a salesman. No, the salesman totally held that and got the feeling of being able to channel right. off of it. And then Daman says he tried and it didn't work and he made his crew members try it and it didn't work. And he was like, "It's, but it does look old, so that's nice. And right. He just thinks it's an old statue, but it's you're right. It's probably – Because Bale Daman isn't a channeler. Yeah. But that the guy who sold it to him totally had the talent. Whether or not he had the spark or not, I'm not sure. Pro- probably not. Probably, probably not. just. Yeah, good catch. I like that. And so I just at that sentence, I was like, "Oh, he's a channeler. Awesome. <laughs> That's why it feels warm." The skull of a cat as big as a lion, and so old it was turned to stone. But no lion had ever had fangs, almost tusks a foot long. Which is just a cool old fossil. It's a saber-toothed tiger. Yeah, fossil. And a thick disc the size of a man's hand, half white and half black, a sinuous line separating the colors. 
uh, we've never seen anything like that before, have we? <laughs> Except at the end of the last book where we found one broken. The shopkeeper in Maradon had said it was from the Age of Legends, thinking he lied. But Doman had haggled only a little before paying, because he recognized what the shopkeeper did not, the ancient symbol of Aes Sedai from before the breaking of the world, not a safe thing to have precisely, but neither a thing to be passed up by a man with a fascination for the old. And it was Hearthstone. Quendiar. So, I, you know, I, I think Doman just thinks, like, he found a cool decorative piece of Quendiar, which is worth a fortune. Right. And he... And, it's, and it looks like the old Aes Sedai symbol, yeah. so he knows it's old, but yeah. he doesn't understand that it's actually a seal on the Dark One's prison. Right. He just knows that it's an unbreakable piece of pottery. <laughs> and this ends up being broken by the end of this book. Oh, uh, yeah. And Moraine takes possession of it. So just to give you a timeline, you know, in terms of when the seals are breaking, they are actually, you know, we see this one hole at the beginning of the book and broken at the end. Doman thinks he was afraid it was what his pursuers were after. Light sticks and ivory carvings and even bows turned to stone. He had seen other times, other places, yet even, even knowing what they wanted, if he did know, he still had no idea why. He tells his first mate to sail west. So he's just trying to go in the opposite direction that the people have been trying to get him to go in. Yeah, they had told him to head east, and he so he pulls out and runs in the other direction. Good instincts. You don't think they were trying to manipulate him into going east, do you? No. I think they really wanted him to go hand away. that letter yeah. and be detained. They're trying to get that seal. Hell or high water. Yeah, because otherwise nobody gets it. Moraine gets it. Right. Which, I mean, Wait, I guess... No, um, hmm. the Sean Chan High Lord gets it first. Yes. And he, he puts it next to... Turok. He has another one already. That's right. So yeah. he, he ends up having two at the end of this book, and both end up being broken. Because at the end of the book, Moraine has three broken seals, and none are intact. This is the first mate speaking. I'll doubt we'll make, I'll doubt we'll make much off towns on, on Tome and Head alone, even if they are safe. Falm's the largest, and it is not big. The Tyrebonners and Domani have always squabbled over Ameth Plain and Toman Head. Even if it has come to blows this time, a careful man can always find trade. West, Yarin. When Yarin had gone topside, Duman quickly added the black and white disc to the cubbyhole. This is a secret hole he has in the ship that he hides things in. And stowed the rest back in the bottom of his chest. Dark friends are I, said I. I'll no run the, one, the way they want me. Fortune prick me. I'll know. <laughs> it sounds terrible. <laughs> I'll know run the way they want me. Fortune prick me. I'll know. That's much better. Feeling safe for the first time in months, Demon went on the deck as spray heeled to catch the wind and put her bow west into the night dark sea. End. Yeah. So, that's <laughs> so basically he's, he's running away. And he, it seems to work. Yeah. Well, it does for a while. This until he last... gets caught by the Shan Chan. Yeah. But that's not really his fault. I mean... He seems to shake the Dark Friends and the Trollocs by doing this. It's not even necessarily a really bad thing. I mean, he loses his ship and stuff, but if he were a regular guy, he'd probably end up with a career. Yeah. Well, I mean, he ends up married. Yeah. To another he sailor. En he ends up being bought first, but... Anyway, that's that's a whole... Him and yeah. Llewellyn... There are obvious flaws aside, like enslaving channelers... And the really weird other stuff. It doesn't seem like the worst thing ever to li live under the Sean Chan. Like, sure, they make you swear the oaths. You have to follow the rules. But other than that, they pretty much just leave you alone. Yeah, other, other than the enslaving. <laughs> it's, right. Uh, well, other than enslaving the channelers. Yeah. But they seem to re leave regular people alone. Like, they but drag you into town and make you swear the oath. And then they're like, cool, go. Just do your thing. And Rand sort of has to come to that realization that the flaws in the Sean Chan don't necessarily outweigh the benefits that they bring to a torn land. I feel like it's in some ways very Romanesque. Yeah. That you have sort of the Romans as this conquering people, and they did a pretty good job of integrating other cultures into their own without destroying them and bringing order to lands that were very chaotic. So I, I see a lot of parallels there. But at the same time, Slavery was something that went on in yeah. the Roman Republic. But, you know, 
It's something that's gone on in virtually every civilization. Right. It's actually unusual. It, it's kind of odd that none of the main Ranlan societies really have slavery. We, you know, we see it in Shara. We see it in Shan Chan. Yeah. We kind of see it with the Aiel, if you want to talk about. Uh, but Gashane are voluntary. Yeah. I'm thinking of Dat, Datsan. Well, d- uh, that's, that's like a, that's more like a prisoner. True. Yeah, they don't do anything useful. They're just yeah shamed, and you have to do something pretty awful to mm-hmm. to get that. But Kashin are like, it is sort of a form of slavery, but it is kind of voluntary, kind of and temporary. And, yeah, and, and temporary, and they're not ill treated. You know, no, no, not at all. No, I, I wouldn't call that a form of slavery. No. Nah. Not until it becomes a non when the Shido turn it into a non voluntary, non temporary period of service. Very similar. Which is the same. Like isn't it you if you can like touch them, if you can like grab them in combat or something? Yeah, like that? yeah. You, it, they or definitely say that if you touch them with your weapon without killing them. Yeah. You know, basically you know, put your spear, I was going to say sword, but they don't use swords. Put yeah. your spear to their neck and say, you know, surrender. And then you, you take them prisoner. They become, you touch them with your weapon. Yeah. But you don't actually stab them through the throat. But then they voluntarily, like. Then they, they put down their weapons and they become guy shine and nothing they. You Otherwise, know, you bring shame to your family. You serve your time. You work for a year and then. Even if you are rescued done. that day, you serve your year in a day. Yeah. Once you become Guy Shane, your year in a day starts. Um, speaking of Aiel Spears, I was messing around with. I downloaded and installed Diablo 2 Lord of Destruction just to fuck around with it because I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I liked liked that old game, and I I was playing with it a little. And in in the game, there's a few Wheel of Time references that I noticed. For the most obvious is one I was picking up weapons. And I found ran into a magical item called a maiden spear or a maiden spear. Oh, okay. And the image is just it's like really obvious that it's like the blade is like half as long as the spear shaft is. And it's uh it was like plus one to all Amazon spear skills. Oh perfect. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh that's a reference. That's definitely a there reference. There was something else I can't remember what it was now. I feel like I saw a couple. I mean it was they were That's both- really super common for yeah games and books like that to kind of what do you call it well in the fantasy genre was so small back then yeah yeah little references like that like made in spear yeah because you know some of the developers were sitting around reading the wheel of time yeah and you know if you have to like in if you have to invent all the names and types of weapons there are like thousands and thousands of them in this game turn to fantasy literature and see where you can pull a generic sounding name out of a couple of them yeah or just reference and nods. But yeah, Diablo 2 is a dangerous game, my friend. <laughs> Trust me, I've lost more hours of my life to that game. I, I'm good at it now. I'm almost beating it. Yeah, we'll have to do some raids. <laughs> I couldn't find a way to play online, but I did... We could do Overland, though. Oh, nice, nice. You don't need to have Battle.net to play locally. Cool. So probably figure that out all right well i think that's uh another hour and a half of recording so yeah 10 15 good night. timing that was pretty productive yeah all right guys good night i think it was a pleasure having you a lot of, a lot of good feedback today thank you so much thanks for hanging out you guys are awesome software that I use. I use Audio Hijack. And it's from a small enough developer, and their software is good enough, I do want to support it. Especially if we're using it for a legit... I've tried to use only legitimate products in the making of the podcast. Either free or things I've bought. Yeah. I'm a big fan of open source stuff. Yeah. Seth is too. 
or cheap little single use programs that you can pay 20 bucks for and do their one thing really well it doesn't have to be a behemoth yeah I'm also a big fan of paying as little as possible for things. <laughs> yeah, well, as is shown by the uh, egg crate walling hanging up behind you. Well, we've gone into this before, but we're, in fact, not wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty regular Joes. Oh, come on. Sometimes I, I blow a paycheck on a burger. <laughs> The whole paycheck. Well, you know, all, all my discretionary funding. I get a really nice burger. <laughs> no, I mean, we're not. Neither one of us is in, in any way broke. No, I pay rent and buy nice groceries. Yeah. That's mostly it, but. <laughs> and I put hobbies into alcohol and other sure, things. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, there's, there's other ways. Be lying if we said we couldn't hang out at the pub, but. Right. But I'm, uh. I'm not checking my stock options on a regular basis. We'll put it that way. LOL. <laughs> Money. It's a crime. I found out the other day that Julia had never listened to Dark Side of the Moon. Because for some reason, I, f- I forget why, we were uh, sitting around talking about pot came up. And being a teenager and smoking pot came up somehow. And I was like, you know, I figure you're barely – a real American, if you've never smoked a bowl and listened to the dark side of the moon, like, you know, they're like, that's like a bit, that's, that's like teenage, like you got to do that. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, maybe it's a little dated cause I'm not young anymore, but, and she was like, what's dark side of the moon? And I was like, ah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Just, I'm not that much. I'm only four years older than her. It's not that much. Yeah, no, I'm, that that's definitely. <laughs> she doesn't have an excuse. She's old enough that she should totally know what Dark Side of the Moon is. But she also doesn't smoke. So I think I had watched Dark Side of the Moon synced up with The Wizard of Oz long before I ever smoked weed. Yeah, <laughs> like you just did that. <laughs> It was cool because you wanted to see when the like the lion roar synced up and like that was a real thing. Although, yeah, you know, I was talking to a buddy the other day and we both we we kind of agreed. I don't know how true this is, but we kind of agreed that like people that are four, five, six years younger than us are kind of in a to- a different bracket. Like they a decade younger yeah, than me. They don't remember not having the internet. Yeah, you know what I mean. That. It was kind of a, kind of a bit of a different time. And even when we first got the internet, it was like this commodity. Like some people had it, some people didn't, you know. I don't know. And you had to like not – I did not be on the internet because my parents were expecting a phone call or they wanted to use right. the phone. <laughs> so I feel like people a little bit younger than us are kind of tapped into a little bit different cultural, you know. Like me and Jules listen to different music. We kind of – get different references Mm -hmm. but we really hit on star wars and fantasy and books i mean is there anyone now that can't relate on star wars i feel like it's that's true star wars big enough and universal enough and it's hit the last three generations pretty heavily that's true (laughs) i was like forced into it (laughs) remember a couple of my cousins were like what you haven't seen Star Wars when I was like 11 and they were like, you're watching it all today. And I, they, they, they made me. Yeah. Good. I watched the whole thing. Good. <laughs> and that was, you know, the, the old ones. I honestly could not tell you the first time I saw Star Wars. It's such a part of my memory that I, I have no idea when the first time I saw them was. Yeah. Like we were all into science fiction and stuff, but that was not cool at the time. I definitely hid the covers of the Wheel of Time books because I didn't <laughs> want people to know what I was reading. Because really? Being into fantasy and it just wasn't cool. Like, yeah. Reading anything was uncool, much less reading. I hear you. Yeah. You, what are you reading? Fantasy? Oh, is that like sexual fantasies? <laughs> and it didn't help that a lot of the covers were like big breasted women. In sh- I mean, not the Wheel of Time ones, but a lot of them. No, totally. Some of those old. Were just Some really older stuff. Ugh, horrendous covers. That's that cousin's sister is the one that handed me Eye of the World. You should thank her. Yeah, everybody on the podcast should thank her. Actually, we're <laughs> <laughs> everybody listening to the podcast. She's we're named after the same person. She's Patricia. 
Not nice. even kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?